Huge game for the LSU Tigers this weekend. First in-conference road game taking on Ole Miss in Oxford. Let's get to know the Rebels. You are locked on LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, thank you for making Lock and LSU your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We can also find us on YouTube as well. Locked on LSU. Just hit that subscribe button. We're going to hit 3,000 subscribers by the Alabama game. I know we can do it. I know you can do it. So let's get 3,000 subscribers by Bama. But we got Ole Miss this weekend. First in-conference road game for LSU. LSU opened as a two and a half point favorite over the Rebels. Let's get to know Ole Miss. We'll sit down with Chris Gordy, host of Locked on SEC and Stephen Willis, uh, host of Locked on Ole Miss. And what's happening, everybody? On today's show, it is a crossover edition. It's a full-on preview of one of the biggest games in the SEC this week. It is LSU at Ole Miss. We'll talk about the key matchups, keys to a victory, and much more. Locked on SEC crossover edition happens now. You are Locked on SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's happening, everybody? Welcome into a crossover edition of Locked on SEC, Locked on LSU, and Locked on Ole Miss. It's great to have you guys along. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked on. Make every moment more right now. New customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. I'm Chris Gordy, host of Locked on SEC. Joining us today, it is Caroline Fenton, host of Locked on LSU, and Stephen Willis, host of Locked on Ole Miss. We thank you guys for making us uh, one of your shows, your first listen every day, free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. All right, guys, let's jump into it. Caroline, we'll start with you. You cover LSU. Give me your assessment of LSU through the first four weeks of the season. Yeah, it's a lot of high highs and it's some low lows. Uh, last week against Arkansas was a lot more stressful for LSU fans, a lot more stressful than I anticipated it to be. I said, hey, Arkansas, or, excuse me, whoa, LSU by two touchdowns over Arkansas. But KJ Jefferson did that thing that he tends to do where he just happens to put a Superman cape on and plays absolutely out of his mind. And he did that against LSU and he was able to keep it a lot closer than anticipated and played a heck of a game. And Arkansas as a whole played a heck of a game in Death Valley last week. Overall, my, my, you know, assessment of this LSU team is that this offense has the makings of being elite. Jaden Daniels is playing at an incredibly high level. You don't just have Malik neighbors, but you also have the emergence of Brian Thomas as well. And he's always been there, but Brian Thomas had Malik neighbors esque stats against Arkansas last week, over a hundred yards receiving two touchdowns, Malik neighbors with a pair of touchdowns himself. You also have found your new go-to running back in Logan Diggs, the Notre Dame transfer that didn't play against Florida State, came in against Grambling, and we all were like, okay, hold on, have we figured something out? Now he's really emerged as kind of the workhorse back, but LSU has an incredibly deep running back room that they can utilize Noah Kane and Josh Williams and, and John Emery to where you're not putting all of the work onto one running back. Now, I said at the beginning of the season, I don't want to see any running backs getting tired. You got you got eight quarter, uh, eight running backs in that room. So the offense has the makings of being elite. We've seen some slow starts. We saw that against Arkansas. The defense, shockingly enough, is one of my biggest concerns. And I think it's a tale of two defenses. That's a, a, a solid defensive front. If it's not Harold Perkins, it's Mason Smith. If it's not Mason Smith, it's Makai Wingo or Jordan Jefferson or Savion Jones or the young gun Whit Weeks who has stepped up and has been playing like a veteran. But the secondary is a concern. The secondary is absolutely a concern. They gave up eight of third, eight of 13 third downs to Arkansas last week. Most of those stops came in the red zone. 
What's the coincidence there? You're not relying on the secondary in the red zone. So secondary is absolutely, I would say, LSU's a biggest Achilles heel right now. But the defensive line can get some the, some stops in the offense. Man, oh man, can it put up some points. Yeah, it's so weird. For so many years, LSU was always known for dominant defense. They just couldn't find a quarterback. Now they've got the quarterback. It's just the defense has some questions. So going to be interesting to see. Steven, uh, maybe not the best time to be asking you what you think of Ole Miss through the first start of the season. Uh, obviously, the lost Alabama last week. But where are you on Ole Miss? I, I, I'm actually fairly high on Ole Miss. They start at the season kind of as an offensive juggernaut and things like that and go through Tulane. They kind of struggled offensively and sputtered in the run game. Same thing happened with Georgia Tech, even though they broke through and eventually got to 300 yards. And then Bama happened. And everybody went to this game. And Lane Kiffin started kind of just trolling Alabama and over and over again and getting people the idea that, hey, this is the year that we can get Alabama, which, honestly, this was a year that we could get Alabama. But it was a situation when you get into the game and it actually happened, the defense played very well above their head, kind of. The offense sputtered. They were like two or three or th of 13 on third down. They did not do that particularly well at all. We'll uh, talk about key matchups for the game, but that it's going to be third down when Ole Miss is on offense. and. But against Alabama, it just didn't work. You had a situation, the defense was just playing their hearts out. But over nine plays, three, three and out, it was basically three incomplete passes and punt, three possessions for about a total of a minute of time of possession. That zapped Ole Miss's team. Even though they were ahead seven to six at halftime, everybody knew what was possible. Then Alabama threw the um, long pass, got the field goal, threw another big pass, and all of a sudden it was like He-Man, you know, by the power of Grayskull, that type situation. Alabama is here. They have woken up. And Ole Miss was in all kinds of trouble in the third and fourth quarter of that game. So losing to Alabama and Tuscaloosa is – you can't make that a season ender. There's a difference from being mad and not being a moral victory and then kind of going overboard. And I think a little bit is happening of that this week. I mean, we've buried LSU in week one. We've buried Tennessee in week three. I mean, we bury teams in the SEC. So I, I don't know if it's exactly all there. All I know is defensively, Ole Miss is better than we thought they'd be. Offensively, they are sputtering. And part of that, I think, the play calling in that LSU game was it, it was terrible. If you're struggling on the offensive line, let's ask them to block five stars for four seconds. That's that's a good plan. and. And you you figure out what's going on. And if Ole Miss figures it out, they have a chance to be pretty good. And there's a chance that they can beat LSU on Saturday. And we're going to talk about that in, in segment three. But overall, I guess that's a long way to say I'm happy. But, you know, I saw it. <laughs> It's it's just been one of those every year. Maybe Lane next year uh, or mm -hmm. uh, whenever he faces Alabama again, maybe his approach will be just not saying anything. Just keep your mouth shut the whole hey, week. We don't we don't no. play we don't play Bama next year, so I that's know, a win right? for us. Yeah, if he hasn't learned now, when's he gonna? <laughs> not once. <laughs> be before we get into this matchup, guys, we normally kind of hit on you know what's the biggest storyline or the biggest story with your team this week. And Stephen, I want to start with you first because there was some big news this week. Michael Trigg. A big time tight end, um, no longer with the team. What happened? Well, um, I didn't see the air quotes when you said big time tight end. Um, he did catch a pass against Tulane that kind of saved that game, but he was running third on the depth chart. He is he has had a fall that was a little bit, let's say, eventful. We we will say that. Um, but with Caden Priestcorn coming back, that's probably the news that he played a good bit against Alabama and he's going to be available. And this is the first game that Ole Miss is going to have all of their offensive weapons at their disposal. Um, and we get to see exactly what that looks like. But Michael Trigg, um, I'm a, it's one of those things you wish him best. You hate that it didn't work, but it's kind of a situation to where the kid kind of took coaching as criticism and he just couldn't get past that. Yeah, and, and Caden Priestcorn in, in defense, I talked with you this offseason. You were a guy very high on him, transferring mm -hmm. him from Memphis, and looks like he's a little bit healthier this week, so we'll see what role he plays yeah. this week. Uh, and by the way, Trey Harris sounds like he's a little bit healthier, uh, Zachary Franklin. So uh, with Ole Miss, it's just about getting these guys healthy. If they're healthy, yeah, mm -hmm. this offense will be off and running, right? Yeah, yeah. All we, all we have to do is protect for Jackson Dart, and, and there, there, there needs to be a way to – 
give the offensive line a little bit of a break. And once you can vary the tempo of where the ball is and maybe change the spot of where he's getting rid of the ball where other teams just can't tee off, this offense has a chance to be really, really explosive. Caroline, I don't know what the the biggest storyline for LSU is, although one that was watching this past week was this team moving forward without Greg Brooks. I, I thought Andre Sams played very well at safety, major major burns at the other, you know, out of position a couple times last week, got burned a little bit, but they seem to be kind of still collectively coming together. Andre Sams played very well, but what, what's your story or storyline, I guess, for LSU this week? Yeah, uh, incredibly tragic news coming out about Greg Brooks. Um, You know, he transferred in from Arkansas defensive back and he had been complaining about vertigo and headaches. And Brian Kelly said, "Okay, enough of this. You've been going through this long enough. He had an MRI revealed a brain tumor. So he underwent surgery and he's okay. He's in recovery. But Brian Kelly talked to the media on uh, earlier this week and said it's going to be a long and really hard recovery for Greg Brooks. So I know that we all are and the entire SEC is going to be cheering for Greg Brooks, but it's about who's stepping up. Um, you mentioned Andre Sam, a transfer in from Marshall, and he had a couple of big plays against Arkansas, a big tackle early in the game, and then the interception to kind of shift momentum. You know, Jaden Daniels throws that interception early on, and I'm thinking, oh boy, like Arkansas has got all the momentum in their corner. Now they get the ball back. They have the potential to make this game really uncomfortable for LSU. Andre Sam steps up with a big interception. Momentum shifts back to the LSU sideline. I would say one of the more interesting and maybe underrated storylines nationally about LSU is how much uh, contribution they're getting from their true freshman. Whit Weeks, I mentioned him. His older brother, West Weeks, is on the team as well. So Omar Spates, he's, you know, he's a five-year starter in college football, you know, first team all Pac-12 at Oregon State, team captain at Oregon State. He transfers into LSU. I thought, okay, this is great experience and seniority being added to that linebacker room. Omar Spates went down with an injury uh, leading into the Mississippi State game. He wasn't able to play. Whit Weeks, true freshman, steps up and plays out of his freaking mind his older brother West Weeks who's been on the team for three years been waiting for that opportunity kind of gets leapfrogged by little brother and he has been playing he's lights out he's had a fantastic couple of games had a big sack when it really mattered most when Arkansas was near the goal line last week so his contributions Caleb Jackson running back is another one if you've seen that viral clip against Mississippi State when he just bodies of Mississippi State safety and kind of stands over him. That guy was a true freshman. Um, So, you know, you're getting contributions from your first year players, whether they're transfers or true freshmen. And you're kind of seeing the roots of that depth so much more so than Brian Kelly's first year when they were just trying to field, you know, 11 men on offense and defense. Now you're really starting to see that depth and the, the fruits of the recruiting classes labor. What is you know, some- Chris, yeah, go real ahead. quick, um, with Greg Brooks, I am a fellow brain tumor survivor. I've been through that. I've gotten that MRI. I had a 19-hour surgery. Gosh. It's life-changing, but Ole Miss needs to do something for Greg Brooks. Th- this is beyond rivalry. This is beyond everything. This is beyond Magnolia Bowl. Greg Brooks is going through some stuff right now, yeah. and he needs some people to support him. It's going to be a long road. He's going to be fine. Greg, if you're watching this, man, you've got this. You have absolutely got this. If I can do it, I know you can. Well, luckily, we still got you with us, Stephen, and we're going to get to some key matchups in this matchup coming up next right here on our Locked On Crossover Edition. I want to tell you about Nutrafol. So a few months ago, I noticed some thinning right at the front of my head. Whenever I pulled my hair back into a ponytail, I noticed, wow, not as much hair and not as thick as it used to be. So I turned to Nutrafol to really help some of the thickness and to just to help my confidence a bit with some of the hair thinning. And you don't have to choose between hair growth and your health. I know there might be some things that you might see promoted on social media that are actually kind of harmful to your health that might have drugs or compromises for better hair. You don't have to compromise better hair with Nutrafol. They provide a whole body health approach for men and for women that promote healthier hair. 
Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement clinically shown to improve hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Nutrafol's hair growth supplements use physician formulated natural science backed ingredients. They've got drug free patented technology that provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sexual health. So go to Nutrafol.com slash men to take their hair health wellness quiz. Identify causes of your thinning hair and Nutrafol will give you a personalized plan for better hair health through whole body wellness. So for all my men listeners out there, Nutrafol has something for you. For all my female listeners out there, they've also got something for you as well. Just take their hair quiz like I did and enjoy healthier hair moving forward thanks to Nutrafol. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the root causes of thinning, such as stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, metabolism, all throughout your whole body health. So take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. And for a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping while you go to Nutrafol.com slash men and enter the promo code locked on college. You can find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men. That is spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men, M-E-N, and enter pro- promo code locked on college. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code locked on college. College football season is here, and this season, Locked On is kicking up our coverage with Locked On College Football Kickoff Live. Every Friday, Locked On will go live from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 10 a.m. to noon local Baton Rouge time on every Locked On College YouTube channel. College Football Kickoff Live will cover playoff implications, the conference rivalry games, and go in-depth like only Locked On can, including insight and analysis from our stable of Locked On College hosts covering their team every Every single day. So find Locked On College Football Kickoff Live every Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on any Locked On College YouTube channel, including Locked On LSU. You will not want to miss it. All right, jumping back into this, uh, joined by our friends uh, Caroline Fenton and uh, Stephen Willis as we do a little crossover edition here of Locked On SEC, Locked On Ole Miss, and Locked On LSU. And guys, let's get into some of the key matchups in this game. Um, Stephen, we'll start with you. Just what's the biggest uh, matchup in your mind, whether it be Ole Miss's wide receivers versus LSU secondary, whatever it is, what's the big matchup in your mind? It is absolutely the Ole Miss running game against the LSU front seven. If Ole Miss can run the ball against LSU and earn the right to throw the ball downfield against that secondary, they will be successful and they would have a probably above average chance of winning this game. You cannot be in third and 10. You cannot be in third and 12 against this LSU defense. They're going to put Harold Perkins on, line him up on the outside and tell him to go get Jackson Dart. And if that happens, you are not going to be successful. It's going to be a carbon copy of what happened a week ago. LSU's got those athletes too. But if you can run the ball and go to second and six to third and two, and you have short and manageable situations where the creativity of Lane Kiffin can take over, all of a sudden this offense has a chance to be very successful. And those longer RPOs against those secondary, they're going to be quite much more effective. The the over-under in this game is like 67 and a half points. They're expecting basically a 38 to 31 type game. So if you have a ticket to this football game, Get ready for the points because I think it's coming. <laughs> there you go. A little betting advice from, from Steve and Caroline. What's what's the key matchup you're looking for in this one? Get your popcorn ready, if you will. <laughs> if I if I can take a page out of Lane Kiffin's playbook. Um, I think for you, I'll stick with the LSU defensive line because that's the strength of this defense. And it's going up against Ole Miss's offensive line. You know, uh, um, Jackson Dart's the third most sacked quarterback in the SEC right now. And I look at that as being a few things. One of the reasons is because of the offensive line. But you mentioned it. A lot of Ole Miss's receivers have been banged up. They haven't been at full strength. So when you don't have your top guys, the ball doesn't come out as quickly. You're more susceptible to sacks. So getting those guys back and healthy, I think, will add another layer to that Ole Miss offense. But to me, it's how can you get to the quarterback? 
that uh, how can you get to the quarterback and how can you stop the run? LSU can stop the run. And Quinshawn Judkins through four weeks hasn't looked like the Quinshawn Judkins that has given SEC West defenses nightmares throughout the 2022 season. So it's it's limiting what they can do in the run game and take away the long ball from Jackson Dart. Haven't seen that as much this season either. I mean, Ole Miss was what? Top five in college football and explosive plays last year. Where was that against Alabama? Where were those big long balls, those big explosive plays, those big game changing type of plays? If you can take those away from Ole Miss and make them beat you in short yardage situations, I think that makes things so much more manageable for this LSU defense and gives this LSU offense more opportunities. Yeah, with, with LSU, they're looking for uh, a little bit more consistency, consistency up front. Makai Wingo has been pretty good there. Ovi gofu has been banged up as far as that edge rusher. But big Mason Smith, it feels yeah. like he's still kind of getting his legs under him. Is it fair to say we still haven't seen the full extent of what Mason Smith can be on this D-line? I haven't even scratched the surface. And this is something that I really talked about a lot throughout the summer was Mason Smith will be back and ready for Florida State. Now, I didn't know that the NCAA was going to intervene there. But um, I said Mason Smith will be most likely available medically for week one of the season. But just because he's 100% cleared by doctors doesn't mean that he's 100% Mason Smith. He came back against Grambling, and you saw him. He kind of ran in and out of the huddle, looked a little bit confused. And Brian Kelly said, hey, this is a shake-off-the-rust game for Mason Smith. He hadn't played a full college football game in almost two years. It takes time. It takes time to get reacclimated into what you want to do defensively. It takes time to get reacclimated into being, you know, the to really realize all of your potential. And also, look, this is a new defense. The last time that Mason Smith played an, an entire college football game was under the Coach O regime. So it's going to take time for Mason Smith to really settle in. But now he's got three games under his belt. I'm expecting Mason Smith to kind of build upon each week over and over. And also Harold Perkins. You know, he had a, had a sack against Arkansas. He was an impact. Uh, you know, he impacted the game against Grambling and Mississippi State. But I look back to games last year, like maybe Arkansas, where I look at that and say, hey, that was the Harold Perkins game. We haven't seen Harold Perkins have that marquee, you know, just game changing, game stopping kind of game. So I'm looking at those two to really step things up and ramp things up because this LSU team is going to be successful if those two are wrecking games. Sticking with that kind of idea, um, we do on, on Locked on SEC every Monday, we do our winners of the weekend. And it's somebody who just went off, had a ridiculous game, was maybe the difference maker in their game. So, Stephen, we'll start with you. Uh, give me somebody who, if Ole Miss pulls off the upset of, of LSU, give me somebody we're talking about on Monday saying they had a monster weekend. Santarian Perkins, the true freshman, who is basically this year's Harold Perkins. Ole Miss lines him up the end. He had two sacks against Alabama, two and a half tackles for loss. I think what Ole Miss is probably going to have to do is you're going to see Suntarian Perkins line up to Jaden Daniels' right-hand side, and they're going to try and get pressure on the quarterback and force him to scramble left to get the ball to where he can't scramble and get the ball to Malik Neighbors. Because if you look at his passing numbers, about half of his passing yardage is to Malik Neighbors. LSU is very good at getting the ball to him. I think Ole Miss might try to disrupt things by forcing him to move out to the left to where he's either run or it's not quite an as explosive potential if he is rolling out to his dominant side. Caroline, same kind of question. Who's the one person we're talking about on Monday if LSU pulls off the you know a nice win over Ole Miss? Please don't take this as me just completely selling out and me giving you the most obvious answer imaginable. I think it's Jaden Daniels because you know this is going to be a high scoring game. Like Steven just said, I agree. Hammer the over. This is going to be offensive fireworks. Jaden Daniels has proven that when he is at his best, this team can do really special things. I look at a, a trio of games last year and it was Ole Miss, Florida and Alabama. Jaden Daniels was playing his best football. He was, you know, using the ground game to set up the pass game. He was hitting his receivers. He was accurate. He was confident. And he's not turning the ball over. I think those are all keys to beating an Ole Miss team that if you turn the ball over, if you make mistakes, they're going to make you pay. This Ole Miss team, like, don't let that Alabama game 
perceive you, you know, misperceive what this almost uh, offense can do. They can put up some points now. So I think if Jaden Daniels can utilize his receivers, because he's got several pass catching weapons, Brian Thomas, Malik neighbors, Chris Hilton, Kyron Lacey, Mason Taylor, the sophomore tight end. If he can get the ball into the hands of his playmakers, and if he can use his legs as an advantage and not as a crutch, I think he's going to start to continue to heat up in the conversation of potentially even SEC player of the year. All right. There you have it. The moment of truth coming up next. We'll hit on our score predictions and uh, what should we expect this Saturday between LSU and Ole Miss. It's a crossover edition right here on Locked On. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, it is so easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, continuing on, guys, as we get into it, we'll get to our uh, score predictions here in just a second. But first, I want to hit on a few tidbits from around the SEC and get your uh, thoughts. Um in the SEC West, Texas A&M was one of those teams that was expecting to bounce back. The Bobby Petrino experiment has worked out well so far with Jimbo. They had the one hiccup at Miami where they give up 48 points, lost to the Hurricanes. But outside of that, Texas A&M looks good. They've been rolling. But unfortunate news as uh, Connor Wegman, their quarterback, we knew he was hurt. But now the news comes out yesterday that uh, he's done for the season. So a viable backup in Max Johnson. But Caroline, we'll start with you. Uh, does this change your thought on AM at all? Or you've seen Max Johnson firsthand. Is he a guy who can help the Aggies run the, run out wins the rest of the way? This doesn't change my perception about Texas AM at all. I think there are three teams in the SEC that can say that if their starting quarterback goes down, they still have high hopes. Two of us are sitting right here, and the other is Texas AM. Because Max Johnson started his college career at LSU. He stepped up when starter Miles Brennan went down in 2020. He came in as a true freshman and handled it like a veteran. Miles Brennan gets hurt in the offseason. He's done for the entirety of the season. Max Johnson is your starter. And ironically, he uh, he beat a Texas A&M team in 2021 that that LSU team really had no business beating. Max Johnson also steps up uh, for Haynes King when he got injured last year and now stepping up again for Connor Wigman with injury. So this is now four years in a row where Max Johnson has been asked to answer the call when the starter goes down. He is experienced with this. Max Johnson is a good quarterback. He is tough. He can take care of the football. He's got a heck of an arm. So I still think that this Texas A&M team has what it takes and has the playmakers and has the right backup to, to, to still go 9-3 and three or 10-2. and two. I think the interesting thing here is how does this frame the public perception of Jimbo Fisher? I think it's almost a win-win for Jimbo because if Texas A&M just falls flat on their face and Max Johnson looks terrible, which I don't think is going to happen, you could use the excuse of, well, your starter got hurt for the for the season. You know, what do you expect? If Max Johnson looks amazing and Texas A&M potentially makes a run for the SEC West, maybe even gets to Atlanta, then Jimbo Fisher looks like a genius for being able to do it with his backup quarterback. I hate this for Connor Wigman. I really do. He is so incredibly talented. But if I'm going to look at it through you know, a glass half full perspective, I'm happy for Max Johnson to get this opportunity. Yeah, we, we were talking today saying it's it's great news for Jimbo. I mean, if he great loses a bunch of games, he can always point back and go, guys, I didn't have my starter. I'm 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 fine. And uh somebody said uh they said, Well, I guess the other 13 teams are gonna be celebrating. I said, Well, actually 15 teams will be celebrating if Jimbo's back at AM. So we'll see we'll see what <laughs> happens there. Uh Steven, your opinion. Yeah, it, the interesting thing about this is you guys will get AM the same weekend LSU's playing at Alabama. So a lot still to be decided here on who's going to win the SEC West. Yeah, and it's absolutely weird, but the last time Ole Miss played a Texas A&M team that the starting quarterback was the guy that won the job in the fall was 2019. That's <laughs> so crazy. 
Wow. It, it's, it, if you just think about bitten. that. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre. But if you look at the people that's played, like we got Wegman last year and the year before that, um, oh, the kid that beat Alabama, we got him. And it, it, it just happened over. And of course, they ducked us in 2020 because of, you know, and <laughs> it, it, it's just, just play the football game. It doesn't matter right. if you don't have a quarterback, just play the game. <laughs> um, but who needs a, situation- a quarterback? Yeah, <laughs> apparently <laughs> they don't. <laughs> but um, I think they're going to be fine. Max Johnson's a good quarterback. I, I, I thought he was going to end up being the guy whenever Ole Miss played them last year, um, but he got hurt and got knocked out. And you're going to have a situation where AM and Bobby Trino is going to be pretty good. And with Max Johnson, they're going to scheme out some stuff that he does pretty well, and they're going to be an explosive offense. The problem with this AM team is the same problem they had yesterday, and that is the defense. Mm-hmm. If they're good, they're good. If they're bad, they're bad. It, that, that's just where we are with AM. Let's get to it, guys. The moment of truth. We uh, we've previewed the LSU Ole Miss matchup. So, Stephen, we'll we'll stick with you here. Give me your score prediction. Who wins and why? All right, everybody, be sure and click clip it on the bottom so you can have these receipts for later. <laughs> Ole Miss forty one, LSU thirty one. Hammer the over. You have a situation where they use Caden Priestcorn. He's the star of this game. He kind of uses Harold Perkins against LSU. Ole Miss wins this game 41 31. Wow, 41 points. Caroline score prediction and why? The interesting thing about this matchup is it's never close and it is never low scoring. It's always like a, you know, a 54 to 38, like something crazy like that. I could see this game going one of two ways. I think that LSU could either win at 45-14 or it's going to come down to who gets the ball last and it could be like a 34-31 situation. I tend to lean toward it being a a more closely contested game and I lean LSU in, in this one for a couple of reasons. And I think it could be, you know, LSU wins it maybe for the second week in a row with a, with a walk-off field goal. I think it comes down to the fact that LSU is a little bit more established with their playmakers. And I don't mean that to, you know, to slight Ole Miss, but I think that Ole Miss, you know, with the injuries, with the offensive line situation, what we saw last week against Alabama, I think that Ole Miss is still trying to figure out really what it wants to be, what the identity wants to be offensively. I think that, you know, Quinshawn Judkins is your best offensive weapon, but we haven't seen him break out quite yet. I think that that is football malpractice to be keeping that guy in a corner. So I think that LSU just has a better grasp on what they want to be and what they want their identity to be offensively. Yeah, yeah it's an identity this, game. This this game a year ago, I mean, uh, Ole Miss jumps up to, what was it, a uh, to 20 uh, – 2017 lead at the half, and then uh, LSU uh, basically dominated the second half and wins this thing going away 45-20. It is interesting, Caroline, because this was such a, a close matchup in the early 2000s, right, Stephen? Like those uh, the, the Eli Manning days, I mean, it was like every game decided by a field goal, and then in recent history, it's just been very lopsided. There's been a lot of blowouts, and a lot of them in favor of LSU. I'm going to be the independent arbitra- ar- arbiter here. I will go close. LSU 34, Ole Miss 31. Close game, tons of offense. I just think LSU uh, capitalizes. That offense was unstoppable throughout the game last week against mm-hmm. Arkansas. I've, I like Pete Golding. I think he's a good DC. I think he's a year away. I think next year Ole Miss takes that huge leap defensively. I don't think they're there yet. So that's my take. Uh, final thoughts for you guys? Uh, get your popcorn ready. Get your popcorn ready. <laughs> Well, we'll have plenty of popcorn watching this one. 5 p.m. Central on ESPN, of course, come from coming to you from Oxford. Big game in the SEC West for both LSU and Ole Miss. For Caroline Fenton, locked on LSU. Stephen Willis, locked on Ole Miss. I'm Chris Gordy, locked on SEC. Thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, check us all out. Subscribe to these shows. Check us out. Make sure you're in every day or coming back and checking us out. And uh, we'll have more tomorrow right here on our respective shows. Well, thanks for making Locked and LSU your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you to Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC and Stephen Willis of Locked On Ole Miss. Great breakdown there. Hope provided some insight about this game coming up at Vaught Hemingway on Saturday. 
Coming up on tomorrow's edition of Locked in LSU, a full LSU Ole Miss preview. What LSU needs to do to get a win at Ole Miss. What LSU needs to eliminate in order to get a win at Ole Miss. And what a win at Ole Miss would mean for LSU and their race for the SEC West. All of that coming up on tomorrow's edition of Locked in LSU.